talking about uh, some of the things that we've been speaking about really all over the world of late. Uh, I'm talking about the impact of modern agriculture in the 21st century. So without much further ado, we'll launch. Thank you very much. I wish my mom was there. She would have been. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be surprised to hear someone ask you. I realize that I, I connect my computer across the cloud, but I didn't plug this in anyway. So if there's someone who can help, uh, is there a power yeah, right there? Yeah. 
Japanese kids. A couple of years ago, I was in Osaka and Kyoto. They all put it on their belt and holster with all the other devices that they have. And teenagers, and they all go around the streets. And every now and then, they try to check in to see whether their love getty is beeping or buzzing or flashing. And any time it's beeping or buzzing or flashing, they quickly look around to see who else's love getty is also beeping and buzzing or flashing, because then they know they made a potential love connection. So it's a way for so Japanese kids to be able to find potential love partners. So when I talk about this, I teach an undergraduate class of about 80 students at Northwestern on networks, and because I have an appointment in engineering and communication, I have students from engineering, and I have students from communication, and I have them say, okay, so who wants to use this love kit? I don't want to show up hands because it's a private thing. So I use one of these anonymous little uh, remotes where they all put in those buttons, and almost all the engineering and computer science students in the class say, we would love to use this. So <laughs>
realize that taking into account who you know is an important part of how things can get done, even in a productive fashion. The second is cognitive social networks. It's not who you know, it's who they think you know. We don't really act on the basis of who knows who. We act on the basis of who we think knows who. Each of us has a mental image of who's well connected. So Sri may come up and say, oh, Nash is well connected, etc. The reality is that Nash may not be that well connected. But as long as Sri thinks that Nash is well connected, it's going to influence how Sri acts. And that's the way in which we think about cognitive social structures, is our mental map of who's connected to who and our basis of using that as a basis of acting on that. The third one says knowledge networks. It's not who you know, it's what they think. So in this class that I was telling you about that I teach, I asked the students in this networks class that they're going to form teams, and that the teams need to do something that requires Web 2.0 technology. And the moment I say that, all the Asian students in class become extremely popular. <laughs> Every student wants to make sure that their team has somebody from there. Why? Because it's not who you, it's not who you know, it's what they, the rest of the students, think the Asian students know about doing Web 2.0 programming of one kind or another. They find very quickly that half the time they're wrong about it and they miss out on some things. But that's the stereotype. So we do, it's a, it's a network. My view of what Dennis knows, that's a network link between me and Dennis. And we can think of that as a network, uh, as from a network standpoint. And then finally, it's not who you know, it's what who you know knows. So this was an ad for Morgan Stanley Dean Widow from a few years ago when it was still called Morgan Stanley Dean Widow. And the idea here is we're now combining the social with the knowledge. So it's not who you know, but it's what who you know knows, if you see that. So in recap then, social networks is who knows who. Cognitive social networks is who knows who knows who, right? Knowledge networks is who knows what. And cognitive knowledge networks is who knows who knows what. So those are four questions. That's at the heart of a lot of what people study when they look at social networks and how they make Sadly, social networks are not just made up of people any longer. One of the interesting things for us to recognize now is that these networks are what I call multi-dimensional networks. The nodes are often people, but sometimes the nodes, sometimes the nodes in these networks are documents, data sets, analytic tools, concepts. Think of this as a much more expanded view of what a network is. Think of it as a fishnet. You can pick up any one node, be it a person, be it a data set, be it a document and you want to see how it's connected to others. So I may look at a particular document and say, who wrote this document? Who downloaded this document? Which data set was analyzed and reported in this document? Which other document was cited in this document? What were the keywords or concepts associated with the document? You see this more expansive view of a network now, it's a knowledge network, where people are just a small part of it. But even if you're interested in just seeing how people connect to other people, these other nodes influence why I might connect to somebody because I read an article by that person, that person is connected through some concepts that I'm interested in, and so that influences even why people connect to other people. And I'll end this presentation by showing a demo where we build some tools where not only is it able to pick up the fishnet to see what these concepts are connected to, but the next stage then is to say, how can you recommend which node I should go to? for a particular topic. So if I'm interested in smokeless tobacco, it can tell me who are the experts in smokeless tobacco. But it can then rank order them, not only on the basis of who the experts are, but where each of them is situated in the network vis-a-vis -vis me. So if someone is closer to me in the network, is a friend of a friend, that person is going to get ranked higher than somebody who's an expert, but is not that close to me. Why is that? Because we know from a lot of literature that I will not talk about today, but it is in, in some of the readings that I guess the next class is going to be, uh, Shri's class is going to uh, We know this from, uh, from, our, from our previous research that in most instances, we don't go to the experts. I know this sounds like a rational, uh, that it sort of belies rationality. If we know somebody is the expert, we don't necessarily go to the expert. So the next time you don't go to the expert, even though you know it, is don't feel guilty. You're in the majority. And there are many reasons for that. And I argue a lot of it is because of where we are in the networks with these people. We don't go to them because there's an article, let me just put it this way. There was an article in Harvard Business Review a couple of years ago. And the title of the article was Competent Jerks and Lovable Fools. So there are jerks who might be competent, which means you know they're, they're, they are competent, but they, because you think they're jerks or because you think that they're not going to respond to you, you will not go to them. And that happens to all of us. Let me ask you a question in general. Have you been in a situation where you knew something
somebody was an expert but you didn't go to that person? Can you think of why you may not have come? If not you, maybe your friend. If you want to anonymize it. Why would you not go to an expert, even if that you know that person is the right person to answer the question? What would prevent you besides the jerk? Factor. Are there other factors? Yes. I, I would be intimidated that they would be smarter than I am. And That's right. So they, they, they can be very intimidating. Um, let's let's go further with that. What are the what are the ways in which they're intimidating? They might talk in a language that I don't understand, mm -hmm. right? They they speak at this high level mumbo jumbo that I don't understand. It. Sometimes I have a friend of mine, a very good colleague of mine. I'll mention his name because he's he's perfectly comfortable with me saying this. One of my collaborators uh, over the last several years is a very well known social network researcher by the name of Stanley Wasserman. But for those of you who have read anything on social network analysis, he has this book called Wasserman and Faust, which is a very famous. <coughs> and Stanley would tell me he goes. Nash, why is it that people are more interested in asking you a question about social networks than me, meaning Stan? And I didn't have to wait five minutes and somebody was at this conference and said something, asked, asked a question to me in Stan's presence. And Stan said, that's a stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked at Stan and I go, that's why. <laughs> right? This was not even a question they asked Stan, they asked me, but he said that's a stupid question because experts think a lot of questions are stupid. So there are a lot of reasons why they don't do it. So then the question is, what is it? Why is it that we ask people questions, etc.? Okay, let's see. Yeah, this is the next slide. And so this is at the heart of what we do. What is it? Why is it we create, maintain, resolve, and reconstitute our social and our communication and knowledge networks? And so in a book that Sri was kind enough to mention, that Peter Manji, my collaborator at the University of Southern California, and I wrote a few years ago, we talked about what we know from the literature are the various motivations that we this is my only theory slide, and then we'll talk about empirical data. Here is the simple version of this. One motivation for why I create network links is because, of, from an economic standpoint, I want to maximize my individual utility function. So it's a very rational economic model. I'm going to try to create a link with Steve because I want something that Steve has. Right? I'm maximizing my own utility function. The problem is Steve may not return my calls because what's in it for him? Unless there's some other issue. So economic models work some of the time, but often they don't. These are called theories of self-interest because they focus on your individual interest. The second argument is what are called theories of social and resource exchange. In this case, the reason that I may want to create a link with Steve is not because I, just I want something from Steve, but Steve wants something from me. So there's a social exchange that is set up. So this is the market model, right, where you create a social exchange and both benefit from it, etc. So that becomes one way to do this. But there may be a third reason, that the reason I want to create a link with Gary is not because I want anything from Gary or Gary wants anything from me, but instead, the two of us together have a better shot of getting something from a third party. See the distinction here? We create a partnership to get something from a third party. This is the building block of collective action. Whether it's lobbying, whether it's setting standards in an industry, whether it's trying to uh, do a pre-competitive alliance in businesses, we often partner with people because we have improved our chances of collectively getting something from the third party. So that's, those are sort of three big motivations that are listed on the left-hand side column. You go to the right-hand side column, and it may be that the reason that I'm trying to create a link with Sri is not that I want anything from him or he wants anything from me, or together we have a chance of getting something from the third party. The reason I want to create a link with Sri is I walk into this room and I find Shri is just one heck of a popular guy. Everyone seems to be connected to him. And so I want to connect to Shri because everyone else is connected to him. So it's a contagion effect, right? In that sense, it's contagion. I'm infected by other people's ideas. Does this happen in reality? Yes, it does. Two, and the two ways in which to think about it. There's a lot of stuff in social networks that's referred to as the power law, which says that 80% of the connections go to 20% why does that happen? Why is it that there are some places, there are some places like O'Hare that are hubs that get a lot of connections, right? And But most other airports don't. There's a big division. Well, there's a law of preferential attachment. Now, there's a reason. I want to connect to somebody who's well connected, especially because if I'm new, now, as a result of connecting to Sri, I'm two steps apart from everyone else in this room who's connected. So there are good reasons why if you're a new person, you may want to connect to somebody who's already well connected, what that does is it makes the rich nodes richer. And as a result, you get this 80%, 80-20 rule, where some nodes are just going to keep accumulating a lot more links because they're already well connected. And the next one is theory of balance. This comes
comes out of social psychology. You see, what is interesting about networks is it comes from so many different disciplines, right? So social psychology has for a long time, going back to the 50s and the 60s, Haida made the argument that we like to be friends with friends of our friends. Why? I don't know if you've had this experience, but I have on, I have on occasion had not only friends, but collaborators and projects who hated each other's guts. And it's a lot of tension. There's a lot of dissonance when you have two people who are two who are both really good friends of yours, but they don't see eye to eye. Right? You want to have that connection. You like to have that closure. And so what I call that was dissonance, cognitive dissonance. That there is tension in my mind because I have two friends who don't talk to each other. I want to reduce it either by getting them to talk to each other or breaking up with one. So we have this tendency. So the reason that I may want to create a link with Joe is because I'm already friends with Bob, and Bob is friends with Joe. So friends are friends. We do this all the time. It's very comfortable. We feel better about it. Actually, what we feel better about it is not necessarily a good thing. Because if you think about it, it's not in my self-interest, necessarily, to spend time with friends of my friends. Can you think about why that might be the case? Why is it not good in terms of my self-interest to spend time with friends of my friends? Yes? Whether in fact in many cases it is used to 
what your body is. That, in a sense, is your proxy network, right? People you talk to all the time, who you text with all the time. We did a study when I was in Illinois. Excuse me, but is that really surprising? Because relationships are based or built on shared experiences. Right. So that would seem to be logical that what you want to do is if you have a link in your network that you really want to develop, you want to be in close proximity to that person because it's a highly more valuable link for you. Right. I mean, it, it makes so it makes so much eminent sense to you, doesn't it? Yes. And yet there are several of us who don't see things quite as clearly as you have described. Oh. So you don't see it as clearly? Is that no, I, 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 I did not see it so clearly. Let's put it that oh, way. But, you do but I'm converted now, in part because of the research that we've been doing. But I can tell you that while, you, while you're saying this, think about the amount of efforts that are being put around the world, with good reason, to create distributed virtual teams in the area of organizational communication, in the area of all theory. There's a huge emphasis on that, and with good reason. There are, there are studies, I'm going to divert a little bit, I'll, I'll talk about this issue. There are a series of studies that have been done on projects funded by the National Science Foundation. And that the NSF had two big initiatives in interdisciplinary research called um, uh, the Knowledge and Distributed Intelligence, KDI, and then more recently, ITR, Information Technology Research. And they commissioned a study to see that these projects were supposed to be geographically distributed and interdisciplinary. There was a preference for geographically distributed teams and interdisciplinary teams. And what did they find? The studies found that, in general, Teams that were geographically distributed, really geographically distributed, and teams where people were from very different disciplines actually did worse in these projects, which is what you're saying, that they would have difficulty coordinating, they had less publications, they, had, they were able to train with fewer graduates, graduate students, and so on and so forth. But here's the flip side of that. Colleagues of mine at Northwestern have done a study based on 22 million documents in the web of science. And there is an incredibly systematic Finding that. And that is the highest impact articles today have three qualities. They're written in teams, not by one or two people, but typically three, four, and many more. The highest impact articles. They are across disciplines and they are geographically multi university teams. So three, three professors from Harvard will have less impact in an article they write together than if it was one from Harvard, one from Stanford, one from MIT. Okay, so you have a paradox. You're saying that diversity fails in terms of projects at NSF, but they are the highest impact articles. The resolution to that paradox, I think, is profoundly important as we look at these networks, and that is, it is true that most of the time they fail, but when they do succeed, they succeed spectacularly. And so the question becomes, how can we use networks to understand how these teams get assembled in the first place, so that they would not just by chance be spectacular, but could be on a more regular basis. So I'm sorry I digressed there. But proximity, and I, I don't know whether I'll get to this particular finding, so I'll just go ahead and give it to you right now. Um, in our data, based on EverQuest data, so this was you know, a very large network data set, what, what did we find? We found that people go online and form teams online, play and friend and trade online. They are 22.6 times more likely to do it with someone within 50 kilometers of them than between 50 and 80. Online on EverQuest, they could play with anyone anywhere, and yet they're 22.6 times more likely to play with someone within 50 kilometers than between 50 and 800 kilometers. Yes. Well, a lot of times that's because the server you play on is usually specific to your area. Very good your question. Website. You're a savvy, savvy person. <laughs> not, not necessarily in this case, and I'll tell you why. In fact, I say not in this case uh, because we only looked at the server with that is uh, in the case of EverQuest, they have one server for North America. Okay. So the data we found was within North American server, there are a few people who sneak in from other places, but you're right, this is a North American server, and I, I'll show you that in the, in the, if we get to the graphic. But even within that, 50 kilometers made a difference. You can argue another thing, and that's, oh, maybe the same time zone makes a difference. Well, we had that in a separate variable, and yes, that makes a difference, but the 50 kilometers is above and beyond what happens with even being in the same time zone uh, at different places. So. That tells you, just at this point, that proximity continues to be important in creating network links, um, as opposed to our dream that maybe everything is being done online. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just going to touch very briefly and say, here's the good news. Each of those theories that I talked about, theories of self-interest, social exchange, collective action, contagion, and so on and so forth, each of those theories, if that was operating in a network, if people were making network links on the basis of those theories, you would see certain structural signatures in the network. Now remember, the 
real world network looks like a plate of spaghetti. Right? There are links all over the place. But you can begin to say, if I'm looking at that spaghetti, and I've had enough wine, and I'm going to keep looking at it, I'm going to start seeing certain <laughs> patterns in that spaghetti. And so think of, the, think of this as the structural signatures of each of those periods. Which means that if I were to have some kind of a, sorry, if I were to have some kind of a, micros a macroscope, not a microscope, I can use statistical methods to say, how frequently do I find each of these structural signatures within my plate of spaghetti? And the extent to which I can find it would tell me to whether my network is being driven by self-interest, by proximity, by homophily, some combination of Does this make sense? Yeah. So that's the power of a particular set of statistical tools in network analysis that make it possible for us to say, we have some statistical methods. Now we can apply it to really, really, really large networks. So we had an article that came out in Science Magazine a few months ago. And in, in it, along with several of my co-authors, we make a case for something called computational social science. And that social science so far has been restricted by the kinds of methods we use to study, you know, 100 data points, 200 data points, 500 data points, maybe even in the thousands. But when you want to do network analysis, we now have the opportunity to compete successfully with the astronomical community and the physics community where they, where they are able to generate millions of data points and be able to do analysis of that. We have the ability to do that now because we are able to get through these digital traces in our life the opportunity to study just like we're doing with eloquence. So I think there's a real opportunity here to make a quantum leap in the way social science has looked to test some of these theories and to be able to apply it to real world context. We've been very fortunate in our lab called the Science of Networks and Communities of Sonic to try to do this exact thing that I just described in a variety of different contexts, whether it is in science and engineering, whether it's in business, whether it's in entertainment, things like World of Warcraft, or whether it's in societal justice areas. So we've been fortunate we have a whole bunch of projects and uh, have about now 18 people in my lab, which is a whole new experience for me to try to manage how that goes and uh, try to see how this whole thing works, but it's a whole plan all the way from postdocs to undergraduates who, who work on these various projects. I'm going to talk only about, uh, I'm going to go back to the computational social science thing and say that the reason why we're able to collect all this kind of data is because we're not doing surveys. We are doing surveys, but we're not only doing surveys. That there are lots of other ways of collecting data. In computer science, they call it relational metadata. In social science, we call it network data. It's looking at different ways through different means to be able to discern different kinds of data. And so the two examples I'm going to talk from disasters and from WOW is data that is captured digitally and then potentially combined with survey data, but allows us to engage in large scale computational social science of the kind that I hope we can begin to do more of. Here are some of the ways in which you can do it. So we can talk about digital harvesting of relational metadata from text mining. So we can take large corpuses of text, and if you think about it, that's a network. It's a network of words. It's a network of words connected to <coughs> people. Uh, and so you can build links between people. And one of the examples, in the example I showed from disaster, we looked at data related to Katrina, the, the the hurricane, uh, so what we looked at there was we looked at how looking at corpus of text, you can generate a network of people, places, organizations, and concepts that were associated with the, with the Katrina. And that's a network to look at. And that comes by doing a lot of text mining. We can obviously do a lot of web crawling. Many of you are experts of this kind of stuff, so I'm somewhat preaching to the choir, but that's a network as well. And then finally, you have things like the web of science which is also an incredible network because it's who publishes with whom, who cites whom, who co-authors with whom, uh, who is co-cited with whom, for example, and that also forms a kind of network. So the, the thing is that each of these areas have been successful so far. Part of what computational social science can uh, allow us to do is to take it to the next level by seeing how we can combine these different kinds of data so that I can make a recommendation if I want to be move from network science to network engineering. I can make a recommendation of who you should go talk to about something based on data that I got from a text mine network, based on data I got from a web crawl network, as well as what I got from the web of science in terms of your scientific collaborations. Is this making sense? So it's that meshing of data that takes it to a whole new level. Of course, this is the data part of it. I already spoke earlier about the theoretical motivations that we need to know to decide who you may want to go to in these cases. So I'm going to talk now about quickly about Hurricane Katrina, and then um, I'll talk a little bit about HeloQuest and end with a demo of how we build records. So, everyone knows uh, Hurricane Katrina. I 
worked on this project with a colleague of mine from UC Irvine, who's a very well-known young social network analysis analyst, researcher, his name is Carter Butts, B-U-T-T-S. And Carter was very smart, he did something very brilliant. On the day when Katrina broke, he had already been working on emergency response projects before this, he went to the web and began to download these things called SITREPs. SITREP is short for Situation Report. Every local, state, and federal agency is required to post a SITREP whenever there's a major disaster, and if they are involved in it. And it's an open text, it just says, you know, what is the situation, what, where, and how, what progress has been done, what action is planned. So this is an example of a SITREP from the Colorado Division of Emergency Management. It's an open piece of text. And he had plans to have his undergraduate students at UC Irvine code this to get inter-organizational networks, or what he called EMOTs, Emergency Multi-Organizational Networks, which organizations were working with which other organizations to the process. During an emergency, we've alone at other times, but especially during an emergency, no organizational, no organizational researcher is going to be able to get organizations to tell them who they're talking to. They're too busy to do that. Right? You're not going to go and get them to do this. So this was what he was doing. His clever idea was to hire undergraduates, look at this, and from the text figure out which organizations were working with which other organizations. So this was the kind of human coding procedures that he came up with, which was quite interesting. Meanwhile, at Illinois, when I was in time with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, we said, how about we try to do the same thing with text mining? We put the same set of things into a text mining machine, the one they used that was called D2K, Data to Knowledge. There are lots of other really good ones. One that I'm actually uh, particularly impressed with is one that is done by a colleague in communications named Steve Corbin, who's at Arizona State, and he has a tool called CRAWDAD, which is really quite fantastic. It's CRA for CRAWDAD stands for Center of Resonance Analysis. It's a very interesting technique. So, what did we find? Pretty pictures. We took slices of the data, at different points in time. So this is from the 23rd of August to the 25th of August. We took all those documents, all the situation reports, and used that to see what would be the connections between in this multidimensional network. The multidimensional network has some nodes that are blue, people are blue, concepts are, I guess, blackish, location is green, and organizations are red. Right? So we did not just a EMON, not just in a multi-organizational network, but we did networks of organizations with people and places. Now, you recognize some of these things. The SAL is Salvation Army, American Red Cross is ARC, Concept of Shelter, FEMA is right there, Kentucky is there, Bush, Governor Bush is pretty important, Florida is at the center. Because remember, before it got to New Orleans, Katrina hit Florida. So you can see that this is picking up the fact that Florida is central, Governor Bush is central, FEMA is up here. Louisiana and New Orleans are right on the fringe here. But there was something else interesting about this graph that was important. And that is, it's not clear, but if you look at it, there's a whole set of dense connections here among some entities that are involved with it. Those entities all happen to do with the petroleum network. <laughs> so the petroleum network was very well prepared for this. I gave a talk about this to a, a bunch of uh, executives from Exxon last year who came to Kellogg. And I, I never talked to anyone from the industry about these results. And two of them immediately went into their, into their suitcases, or little briefcases, I should say, and pulled out this three-ring binder. And they said that they always are told to carry this with them wherever they go, because that is the way they respond to any disaster or any emergency associated with these things. So you could see they were really well prepared. What is also tragic is that this group out here is the human shelter and animal shelter. And it's a very sparse network. So in real time, or close to real time, you now have the ability to see what parts of the network are succeeding and which parts are less effective. Then we move to time slice two, and so you begin to see there's a new set of players. Governor Bush is now off on the periphery out here. Texas is, uh, is moving in. New York is coming to its military, plays an important role. FPNL is the Florida Power and Lighting System. Florida is still pretty central in this area. So we go through these slices, and what I'm going to get to at the end of these different slices as we move forward is something else. And that is in addition to the visualizations that you see here, you can begin to do analysis on which organizations were central within this. And we've compared your two organizations that were particularly important. The Red Cross and FEMA. Now the numbers on the y-axis represent the rank of how between the how central these organizations were. Right? So low rank means that they were more central. You can see that FEMA was pretty central, just based, now remember, this is, we didn't talk to anyone, we just looked at the SIT reps and computed the networks on the basis of that. And we 
find that FEMA was pretty central. The American Red Cross was not central. It had a very low rank, very high number, it was a low rank. But then all of a sudden, by the time you get a tiny slice of five, the American Red Cross becomes much more central than FEMA. Now go back and remember what happened. Remember FEMA, the head of FEMA, stabbed on the shoulder by then President Bush for doing a good job, and then two days later he was gone. We know something went wrong there. This is an incredible opportunity to see how we can use network mapping to be able to identify in real time and close to real time what are the things that are happening, and we could have tracked this descent, this ascent of the American Red Cross, and how FEMA was falling apart pretty soon out here. So this is an example on a very descriptive level of how you can use this as a way of understanding how things are, how different networks can be used. I'll give another example, which is the WOW example. This is a cartoon that I must confess it took me some time to understand. But it's, I think that's because I come from an older generation that doesn't quite get it. So I'm going to explain this cartoon, which is always a scary thing to do. But the idea here is that you have two players who are in the online space here, who are obviously having a little bit of a feud, and they are trying to, they're having an argument that they are, they're fighting each other in the online world, and then those two people, as it turns out, have avatars in the offline world, and they get so upset by what they've done online, the lady hits a, hits a boyfriend, whoever it is, in the offline world, to show the connection between what's happening in the online world and in the offline world. So this is sort of what we are trying to focus on. To what extent is the offline world shaping what's happening in the online world? So in EverQuest 2, I said we have these four kinds of networks. Who you partner with as a team. So you form these teams that I mentioned earlier. You come together with these teams. The second is you have instant messaging within the game, so you can coordinate within the game. The third network, sorry, the third network is player trade. That is, who do you trade with? Because in these games, you can make things, build things, buy things, sell things, and gift things. So we have all the transaction data. So one thing that is nice that made us able to do the study is that Sony gave us, for the entire game of EverQuest 2, from the time it started, we have all of the actions, <coughs> all of the interactions, and all of the transactions. And to me, I was in, um, it was a moment of great pride when the National Center of Supercomputing Applications, we had about 60 terabytes of data. And it was the largest data set that the supercomputer larger than the astronomy data set. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's so surprised that computational science, social science can generate that kind of data and make these kinds of things happen. How many people play EverQuest? Uh, it's in the middle. Well, you'll see that. Thank you for asking. Uh, I think, oh, I don't think I have that slide yet. Sorry. Uh, it's, they say it's about close to now about three or four million people, which is still much smaller than World of Warcraft. But I'll give you an idea of the size. The people who play MMOs, these massively multiplayer online games, um, if you take them as a collective and you look to see how much of the economy, real world economy is associated with it, that uh, there's a, a, a colleague of ours, uh, Ted Castronova, who is at Indiana University, who's done a study, called, he had wrote a book called Synthetic Worlds. He makes the argument that the amount of real world money associated with MMOs would make it the 14th ranked country in the world in terms of gross demand. So it's not a trivial curiosity. This is really an important part of what is happening in terms of the economy. So this is, this is a phenomenon worth studying in and of itself, even though in this case I'm using it to study more general things about networks. So we had a whole series of networks for this. We said individuals are not likely to just randomly create network ties with others. There's a lot of hype in the media. Oh, teenage girls go on the web and randomly create network links with strangers and all kinds of bad things happen. There's really good reason to believe that that's a lot of hype, that in fact a lot of the interactions that happen offline are far more dangerous for uh, teenage, so teenagers and teenage girls than what happens online, except that the online, uh, when it does happen, it gets so much publicity that the hype definitely overstates the reality of that situation. The second one is what we already talked about, individuals who are already very popular are going to have more interactions, the theory of contagion that I talked about. The third one was transitivity, the theory of balance you'd like to become partners with friends of your friends. So what you're doing, what we're doing here is taking those theories and testing it out on a scale we've never been able to do before because we have so much of network data. Uh, then we talked about geography, the theory of proximity. It says individuals who are proximate in geographical distance are more likely to, eager, uh, to become partners. And we said not only is proximity having a linear relationship, but close proximity is much more likely to create a network link than even a little farther one. So it it's becomes a linear relationship where the closer you are, that's when the real attraction comes. After you've gone to 100 miles or 200 miles, that much doesn't, doesn't make that much difference. <coughs> so moving from 100 to 200 miles, it's going to, if it's going to be twice as 
likely for you to play, then moving from 50 to 100 miles is not twice as likely, but say four times as likely. So the effect tapers off over time. And then, so this is the proximity argument we talked about, and then we talked about the time zone argument, the temporal argument. That is, if you're in the same time zone, you're more likely to play because you're out in the same hours. Of course, the hours when people play this game is not during work hours, it's often after midnight. So that's when you see the time zone effects are running in. And then we had other things like gender, that people would like to play with others of the same gender as them, of the same age as them, and the same level of experience in the game as them. So these are all opportunities to think that, you know, when we assemble teams in the real world, how does this reflect that? Uh, in this particular study, we, we, we did only 3,000 players. I say only because, as I said, we have millions of data points. But part of the challenge here is to do the kind of analysis that I talked about, the structural signatures, uses up huge amounts of time. So it's what I was referred to now as petascale computing. And in fact, we just got a project which we are collaborating with some colleagues in Virginia Tech to use petascale computers that the NSF has just started funding to be able to analyze these kinds of models because they take a long time to run. Uh, this was the GFC, it's also in North America, to go back to your question, so this was a North American uh, zone that we looked at. And most of them were from US, most of them were male, and um, 142 from Canada. So there's lots of statistics that we can look at out here, but I think a picture might describe it. So this is what the four networks look like. This is the trade network, who connected with each other in trade. This is the mail network who were mailing things to one another. Top right is the instant messaging network, and this is the partnership, that is the people who form teams together, right, to play these teams. One of the interesting things about this network is that if you look at the partnership networks, there is a group in the middle that partner with a variety of people who then partner with a variety of people. In networks, they call this one large component. But you also see on the periphery a lot of pairs on, on the periphery. And those pairs are often black and red pairs, where black are males and red are females. So a lot of people are pairing it up, and these are not just online partners. Very often, these are offline partners. Because we did a survey with 7,000 of these people as well, that Sony allowed us to do when they logged into the game. And what we found is that very often, people play this with their partners. Often the male dragging his female partner to play the game. <laughs> but we also found, ironically, and this is not considered, it's not um, directly showed in this network, is that males who were playing with their female offline partners reported being less satisfied with the game than female partners who were playing with their male partners in the game. So that just is